Good morning and welcome to First Memorial. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please join me in our sung approach to worshiping our God. You'll find it on hymn number 40, Joy to the World, number 40. And now please join me in the opening words printed in your bulletins. Praise the Lord. Praise God from the heavens. Young men and women alike, old and young together. Let us praise the name of the Lord, whose name alone is exalted above the earth and death. Good morning, saints. Let us begin with a call to confession, where Jesus, our Lord, came into an indifferent world, Yet his life revealed the inner thoughts of many. So let us confess our sins before God and one another, that we may receive release from our sins. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not lived as your faithful children. We have kept silent in the midst of prejudice and hatred. We have been idle in the face of violence and injustice. We have not been a light to the nations, and our lives have not revealed your glory. Forgive us, merciful God. Repair the ugliness of our sin, and restore in us your beautiful grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Beloved of God, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, God covers us with the love of righteousness. Know, therefore, that you are forgiven in Jesus Christ and are to live as God's beloved. Thanks be to God. The hymn of praise today is number 22, Angels from the Realms of Glory, 2-2.
And let us join our hearts and voices in reciting together an historic confession of faith. This one from the PCUSA Book of Confessions, literally the Scots Confession, chapter 6. When the fullness of time came, God sent his Son, his eternal wisdom, the substance of his own glory, into this world, who took the nature of humanity from the substance of a woman, a virgin, by means of the Holy Spirit. And so was born the just seed of David, the angel of the great council of God, the very Messiah promised, whom we confess and acknowledge to be Emmanuel, true God and true human, two perfect natures united and joined in one person. Amen. You know, we've got good news to tell. He was laid in a manger. So let us make room for him in our hearts, like he has done for you and for me, and reach out to all God's children with this special love of his. Without moving from where you now stand, please take the next few moments to share a warm greeting and a sincere sign of God's peace with those around you. Thank you. Please be seated.
Helps if we turn on the other part. Okay, so, did you guys have a good Christmas? Yeah? I know in our house, Christmas was a little bit different this year, right, Aria? Why was it different? Because your brother was sick, right? Yeah, so we didn't get to go over to Aunt Kristen's for brunch. We didn't get to go to their other grandma's house for dinner and open presents with our cousins. So, he was a little bit disappointed. Right? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was pretty stinky. But, so, have you ever, has that ever happened to you before? That you looked forward to something so much, like Christmas, and then it happens and you're a little bit disappointed because it maybe wasn't exactly what you thought it was? Have you ever happened, have you ever thought of something so, and so excited for it? Yeah? Another channel. <laughs> All right. Well, in today's scripture lesson, that doesn't happen, okay? We have Simeon and we have Anna, and they're two people that work in the temple. And God has told Simeon, just wait, you're going to get to see Jesus before you die. You're going to get to see the Messiah. And so they wait, and they wait, and they're so excited. And Christmas happens, Jesus is born, Mary and Joseph bring him to the temple where Simeon and Anna work. And guess what? They get to see him. Do you think they're disappointed? No. Super, super excited, right? And I actually have a picture here. Pastor Allen printed it out. Look, there's Simeon meeting the baby Jesus. See? See? You see it, Aaliyah? Yeah, he's so excited because he's waited for so long, and he finally gets to see it because he knows, because God told him, that Jesus is going to come and save everybody. And and Anna and Simeon, they're not young. They're older people. So they've been waiting forever for this. All right. So we need to remember, right, that even though things may happen, like somebody gets sick on Christmas, we don't need to be disappointed because there's a plan. That happened for a reason because God has a plan for all of us, right? He had a plan for Simeon and Anna that they would wait their whole lives and they would get to meet baby Jesus. So, even though things don't happen as we want, we shouldn't be disappointed, okay? We should be excited, we should be happy, and we need to remember that God has a plan for us. So, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for sending us the best Christmas present ever, baby Jesus. He, you sent him to save us, and we know that just like you, told, you promised he would save us, we know that you will always keep your promises for us, and we should never be disappointed. Amen. Today's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it was written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice, according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, 
Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which has been prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul, your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanelom, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At, the moment she came, at that moment she came and began to praise God and speak about the child to all who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. For you and for me. We're looking especially today at the 32nd verse, a phrase actually, in the second chapter of Luke, which reads, A light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to your people Israel. A light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to the people of Israel. This is when I get to remind you that, liturgically speaking, this is the first Sunday after Christmas Day. Liturgically speaking, because we take the great events of Jesus' life and ministry and compress them into 52 Sundays, which is where we get the readings from, the lessons that we read to you, and hopefully I can preach on. Sometimes that's easier than others. This is the first Sunday in Chris, after Christmas Day. It's also stated in another way, the first Sunday in Christmas tide, in the time of Christmas. See, Christmas ain't over yet. Go ahead and throw out your trees and the tinsel and all the wrapping paper and whatever else you do to get back to normal. But Christmas isn't over yet. We're not done celebrating because more good things are happening. And this story today is one of them. Also noteworthy, but aside, this year the Epiphany of the Lord is next Saturday. And the Baptism of the Lord is next Sunday. Those are two important events, and we will deal with them next Sunday before we move on to a period of time called After Epiphany. The guys who wrote the lectionary are not real creative. But while we're on the subject, Epiphany is when we celebrate the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles as represented by the Magi. And Baptism of the Lord is when Jesus presented himself to his cousin John the Baptist in preparation for beginning his three-year earthly ministry. So he shows up at the River Jordan. John says, I shouldn't be doing this to you. You should be doing this to me. Jesus says, no, follow the script, and let's do this the way God wants it done. And so they did. And then he went on a 40-day retreat in the wilderness. Only noteworthy thing that's said about that in Scripture, of course, is that he was tempted by Satan. And there were some pretty crafty temptations. Again, we can talk about them maybe next week. 
So today, our scripture lesson takes us to Jesus being presented in the temple by his parents as a firstborn son. In Jewish life, and according to the laws of the scriptures, this is a big deal. For firstborn male livestock, for those who are into domestic animals, the, the firstborn male to a, a mother is uh, to be presented to the Lord as a sacrifice so that nobody else can ride him or use him or eat him or do anything else. He set aside just for God. And that was how they did it in those days. And the firstborn male child of a marriage are dedicated to a life of service to God throughout their lives. Not just once a week, not just once a month, not just when there's nothing else on the calendar. Every day they are to serve God. And Jesus was the ultimate example of that because his ministry, his service to God was so profound, it changed history. It changed how we knew God and what we knew about God. This firstborn son being set aside for a life of service to God perhaps is why years ago firstborn Roman Catholic sons were expected to become priests. Not so much today. Moms want grandchildren. They don't want priests for sons. Right? Just ask them. The graphic on page one of the Bolton, that picture up at the top half of the page, is a picture of Mary holding Jesus. Although I think it more likely in the culture of that time and place, it would have been Joseph who was holding Jesus. Because this was a male-dominated culture where a child belonged to the father. And when he was old enough to behave and to be with other men, then the father would take him to synagogue on a daily basis where they would study the Torah with the rabbi, rabbi being teacher. So in this situation, However, Joseph played no biological part in Jesus' conception. That was the Holy Spirit's work. And back to the graphic at the top of the page, there is a third adult prominently displayed. I'm sorry Anna wasn't included, but because this was a confession of faith, as it were, to, by Simeon, who recognized immediately who this child was and the child's significance in history. Simeon had been promised by the Holy Spirit as a young man who prayed daily for the coming of the Messiah. He never gave up on that. He didn't schedule it once a month. He did it every day, pleading, hoping, trusting that God will fulfill his promise. And so the Holy Spirit came to him and said, you know, keep it up, but don't worry about it because it's going to happen that you will see the Messiah before you die. Which made him, as Megan adequately explained, very happy with a lot to look forward to. And on this particular day, oh my gosh, he was out of his mind with joy and gratitude. This was a big deal. Didn't involve a big meal, didn't involve all kinds of family getting together, didn't involve the exchange of presents, didn't involve sending cards, didn't involve decorating the house, didn't involve any of the stuff that we spend so much time and worry about today. It involved a reward announced by the Holy Spirit to a righteous man who lived a devout life and never stopped praying for the Messiah to come. So Simeon took his, Jesus in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, 
Now you are dismissing your servant in peace. That means he could go anytime. He's ready now. He's got what he's been living for. He's been given what he was promised. Dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. That's a very important line, in the presence of all peoples. It just wasn't for the Jews. It just wasn't for that little corner of the world. It just wasn't for the people who spoke that strange language and memorized those ten rules and went to Passover in Jerusalem at least once in their life. Big deal. Very, very, very big deal. Jesus coming was for all people. Theologically speaking, unlike us, Jesus carried no sin of his own. So the purification that the law required needed to take place because he carried the sin of humankind on him. He still had to go through that. If he was going to take our place on all the things that mattered because of our sins, he was going to have to have the sins that were on his back from his birth because we put them there. That that would happen. The sin of humankind was on him. And all that walking he did from town to town, the hillside to seaside, all of that he did with the weight of the world's sins on his back. And another interesting twist, if you're paying close attention to the reading, were that the law prescribed that gifts be given by the parents to God in the temple to celebrate the gracious gift of a male child. The first one, anyway. Very important. Although I really don't understand that it is now more likely that the parents of a newborn will be the recipients of gifts. Perhaps, and I'm only guessing here, in today's culture, parents have already spent a bunch of money on behalf of their newborn being delivered with doctors and hospitals and other medical facilities, new furniture, crib, car seat, baby carriage. You ever added those up? Of course you have. They ain't cheap. And an assorted other technology for newborns, like the baby monitor, so that you can hear the child breathing in every room of the house. I'm so old that we didn't, we didn't uh, have disposable diapers. We had a service come to the house, pick up that white pail by the front door. Ugh. They earned their money. <laughs> Driving around in the summertime in a hot truck with those in the back behind the seat? I don't think so. But for our purposes today, I feel inspired to inform you that Luke's gospel teaches that like Simeon, though probably not as righteous and devout as he was, nor as focused on and longing for the consolation and redemption of God's people, his family, Israel. You remember Israel. Father Abraham had many sons. Everybody considered himself a son or daughter of Abraham. That was a badge of honor. That's what set the Jews apart from all their neighbors. According to God's plan, you and I are supposed to receive the same blessing as Simeon. Did you realize that? That's why it's in the scriptures. That's why we celebrate it every year. Because we are supposed in our lifetime on earth to see Jesus, to hear him, to know him, to have an idea of what he's like because he gives us the best idea of what God is like. And we're supposed to do that before we die. That's our number one reason for being on earth. 
is to meet Jesus and learn how to relate to him through prayer and study and all the rest of it. And it's our job as parents not just to send the kids to Sunday school, but to talk about it around the dinner table enough that the parents can be sure their children know who Jesus is, that he was prophesied, that he came with a purpose, that he did something for every one of us. Before we die, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And it is by God's desire that you and I know about this salvation business. He was sent for you and for me, and before we die, we are to see him and know him as our Redeemer, our Lord and Savior, to use another phrase, not a phrase without profound meaning, I might add. That's why Christian education at every phase of life is so important. We don't graduate from it with confirmation. We don't graduate from it when we get out of high school and move away from the rules and regulations of our parents, as long as you live under my roof. You know the drill. Christian education is important at every stage of our lives. It should be important to us to see Jesus for who he was and what he came to do for us that we can't do for ourselves. And so, if you live in the South and you're an adult, you're still going to Sunday school. I don't know how we got off so easy up north here, but it's not part of our culture for most of us. But Sunday school, Bible study, daily devotions with the scriptures, it's so important because we are each supposed to know him, Jesus Christ, and how else will we get to know him? How else will we get to know what he wants from us, what he wants for us, what he came to do on our behalf? His identity, his historical purpose are among the most important things, if not the most important thing, you will ever learn. so important because that's our number one task on our pocket calendar or smartphone or computer or wherever you keep track of where you're supposed to go next and what you're supposed to do when because we're supposed to get to know him now because if we don't to whom are we going to go when we cross that threshold it's not about being good. It's about knowing Jesus. So I go back to that picture, that graphic on the front cover of the bulletin, and I ask you to look at it, if not now, when you get home. Don't leave them here in the pews. That doesn't serve anybody any purpose at all. Take it home and put yourself in the picture. You are that guy in the middle. You are Simeon. And God, through the prophecies and the studies of the scriptures that we do throughout our lives, God wants us to know him. So he's not a stranger. When he's standing there at the gate, telling Peter to get out of the way and take that stupid book with him so that Jesus can walk us through. Kind of like a red carpet treatment. Put yourself in the picture. I really struggled with the title for today's sermon, and I'm really sorry that I didn't use Put Yourself in the Picture as the title, because that's what this was all about. And that's what your number one job is. Put yourself in the picture to know who Jesus was and what he came to do in such a profound and intimate way that you're confident of where you'll spend eternity. And it's not because of you. And it's not because you were good. It's because God loves you like nobody else. And he made sure your ticket was paid for and your trip to heaven was covered.
Do we dare to say amen? Thank you, folks. Put yourselves in the picture, will you? Once again, I'm happy to tell you that we are all grateful to have you with us as we worship together on the first Sunday of Christmas Tide. And we hope you will be stewardship partners with us in our ministry here and around the world as you have been partners with us in our worship, whether here in our sanctuary or somewhere safe or more convenient to you on your computer. If you worship with us on your computer, there's no offering plate being passed at your house, I'll bet. But if you are able and willing and feel called to do so, please consider mailing an offering to the church to help us continue what here we're here to do in Jesus' name. As the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so will God cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations with thankful hearts. Let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Let us pray as with one voice. Loving God, we give you thanks for the light and the world of Jesus Christ. For we have received adoption as your children. With Jesus our brother, we dedicate ourselves in ministry to the world, that we may live as heirs of your promises, to the honor and glory of your name. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, and wishing everybody a happy and healthy new year. 
This week's birthdays are William Hasty, Austin Quinones, and we have an anniversary for Justine and John Cutches. Just to let everybody know that Karen Rega has returned home and is doing okay. Condolences and sympathies to my coworker and his family on the death of his grandfather. They are currently doing the funeral service as we have our church service right now. And condolences and sympathies to the Valentine family. Wayne passed away this past week. There is a memorial service for both Sylvia and Wayne on January 3rd at 2 p.m. here in the sanctuary. All are welcome. They will be very much missed. It's good to see Jack and Renee back into the sanctuary. They've been ill for the last two weeks. We pray for all everyone who has been sick during the holidays, and also our continued prayer list, Dora, Gina, Dawn, Hunter, Kendra, Mary, Karen, Wayne, Shirley, Kim, Irene, Sandy, Sonia, Gregory, Madison, Hildegard, Sean, Lily, Nishabi, Larry, Tiffany, RJ, Benjamin, Lauren, Barbara, Karen, John, Henry, Stephen, Dominic, Kathy, Bill, Joey, Stan, Julie, Helen, Nancy, Dawn, Dale, and Jody. We believe, so we pray. Holy God, today we stand at the precipice of another new year like we have done so many times before. Once again, we seem to be facing many political uncertainties, unsolved crimes, unhealed illnesses, unachieved goals, and unpaid bills. Once again, we'd like to blame others for the messes we are in, because knowing what we know and thinking what we think, we don't know how we individually could have acted any differently or changed our course for the better. Perhaps we don't feel like we have the power to change anything which would make things any better. It frustrates us that we don't know what the future holds, nor how everything will turn out. But we are grateful to know that you hold our futures, God, and have gotten us this far in spite of ourselves when we couldn't see the future which is now today. In these troubling times, Help us to hold fast to your promises and presence. Help us to hear and obey the heartbeat of your love. We thank you that you have never failed to hear and respond to our faintest prayer, and that we can entrust those whose well-being is in question to your care and concern. We continue to stand in need of your spirit's sanctifying work to inspire us, to guide us, and to nurture us in the faith with which you have blessed us, especially in the efficacy and frequency of prayer. Once again, we offer ourselves to you, O God, who made us everything we are and gave us everything we are able to have, with the same eagerness and sincerity with which we offer you our Lord's prayer as our own whenever we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our parting hymn today is hymn number 29, Go, Tell It on the Mountain, 2-9.
May you see Jesus this week in the embrace of those who forgive us our debts, in the healing touch of those who comfort the afflicted, and in the affirming words of those who give hope and encouragement. And may you follow their example and thus do our part in making Jesus known to this generation. And one more time, put yourselves in the picture, because that's where God wants you. Amen? Amen. Please be seated for a moment of reflection before you go.